Uh, topic of this talk is uh, fact-checking in the age of Trump. Um, I don't know if anyone here knows the blog. The blog is uh, Two Political Junkies. We've been around for 14 years or so. Uh, do a lot of fact-checking. So uh, let's begin. Fact-checking in the age of Trump. All presidents spin. Some even lie. Nixon said, I'm not a crook. Reagan said he didn't trade arms for hostages. Clinton said he did not have sexual relations with that woman. What's a lie? What's a mistake? And how can we as citizens navigate through it all, especially these days? Before we discuss fact-checking in the age of Trump, we should try to at least define what it means to say something that's untrue. Uh, try to define the difference between something that's untrue that's a mistake versus something that's untrue that's a lie. This is where belief and disbelief, honesty and dishonesty overlap. In discussing disbelief versus non-belief, these definitions come from Willard Van Orman Quine. Denial, uh, disbelief is the denial of a statement. I can disbelieve the existence of Atlantis, disbelieve the existence of the planet Mondas, disbelieve the existence of a tasty cup of coffee for a reasonable price. In the, when I'm saying that, I'm saying that the statement isn't true. There's a difference between that and knowing and, and non-belief, which is not knowing whether it's true or not. For example, are there an even number of David D'Angelo's in the continental United States? We know that there's at least one, me. Are there more? Are there any more? And does that make an even number or an odd number? I don't know. At any one time, the statement is either true or false. I just don't know which one it is, but I do know it's either true or it's false. It's either an odd number or even number. And so there's a difference between knowing whether something is true or false and knowing whether it's true or knowing whether it's false. Finding evidence and compacting evidence is the only way out of finding whether something is true or not. If the evidence points in one direction versus another direction, then that part, that direction is probably the one that's true. Now let's look at a definition of a lie. If I were to say that I have one and only one $5 bill in my wallet, when I know that there's two, that's a lie. Pretty simple. But what if, the, what if it was a Canadian $5 bill and we're discussing American currency and you think I'm talking about the $5 bill with Abraham Lincoln on it, but I know it's something different. That's still a lie, even though it's technically true. It is a $5 bill, and it is in my wallet. It's just not U.S. currency. I'm letting you believe something that isn't true, even though I'm saying something that is. It's technically true. If I believed I had two $5 bills, when in fact I'd forgotten that I'd spent $5 on a tasty cup of coffee, but I only had one. But I said I only had one. I'll restate that just to make sure. I believe that there are two $5 bills in my wallet. I'd forgotten that I spent one, one of the $5 bills, and I say there's just one. That's still a lie, even if my statement just happens to correspond with reality. The reason is I'm attempting to deceive even if it's something that's technically true. If the, purpose of the de to, if, the purpose, bleh, if the purpose of a statement is to deceive, then it's technically a lie. This is where political spin usually happens. Something that's at least close to being technically true, but used to deceive anyway. We can go into some real world examples. In 2003, uh, George W. Bush had State of the Union address stated, this is a quote, the British government has learned that Saddam Hussein recently sought significant quantities of uranium from Africa. That's a true statement. British intelligence had said that. The problem for Bush is that American intelligence couldn't verify it. He did not know it to be true. Uh, in fact, that there was a national intelligence estimate in 2003 referenced a State Department report of 2002 saying that that report African uh, uranium, Saddam Hussein trying to get African uranium, was highly suspect. So Bush did not know it to be true and yet presented it 
as true, framed with the, well, British intelligence says so, it's still a lie because he did not know it to be true and yet presented it as true. You can do another one. Go into uh, Bill Clinton and that woman, Monica Lewinsky. The truth of the statement hinges on whether oral sex constitutes sexual relations. For the record, I believe it does, and so therefore Clinton at the very least said something untrue. But what if he defined it otherwise? Uh, Gore Vidal, in a very interesting piece in The Nation back then, said gentlemen of a certain generation in the South would use that as an excuse that if it was just oral sex, then, well, he didn't sleep with her, so therefore everything else follows from that. So let's assume, for the sake of the discussion, Clinton believed that. That among, in a discussion of heterosexual contact, sexual relations as defined was just that stuff which would require birth control. If that was the case, then he is saying something technically true, but it's still a matter of deception because when he said no sexual relations, it's probably meaning he wanted us to think no sexual contact, which wasn't true. So even though it was a statement that was technically true, it was still a lie because it was meant to deceive. Both of them were dishonest spin. Um, one led to a war, one led to an impeachment. There's an old saying that snow is white if and only if snow is white. There has to be something called snow, has to be something called whiteness, and that snow has to have that characteristic. All those things have to tie together for the statement, snow is white, to be true. Now we have kind of an epistemological frame in place. Let's see if we can put it to some use or start complicating things. How do we know that a historical event happened? And when we look in the news, everything is a historical event, even if it happened yesterday. There's an old saying that news is the first rough draft of history. So Bertrand Russell had a solution in a, uh, an essay called On History. I remember reading it a number of years ago. The only problem is I can't find it again. So it's either not Bertrand Russell or I can't find it or it's someone else. But the story still makes sense. And his solution still makes sense. The example that he used was Hannibal crossing the Alps. How do we know that Hannibal crossed the Alps? I don't know anything about Hannibal. I know Hannibal Lecter, the fictional... Uh, Cannibal, Hannibal Burris, the very real comedian, and Hannibal Smith, the guy who ran the A-Team uh, TV show in the 80s. So let's scrap Hannibal and go with another one. How do we know the Lincoln assassination occurred in April of uh, 1865? None of us were there. None of our parents were there. None of our grandparents were there. It was 52 years, 152 years, six months or so. So that's eight or ten generations, depending on how you define a uh, generation. So how do we know it happened? How do we not doubt that it happened? Well, there's all of the evidence that's left over. I'm sure in the bowels of the National Archives, there's Booth's Beretta. There's the bullet that went into uh, um, Lincoln's brain. There's probably some blood-stained clothing. Um, there's the bed that he, I think, that he died in the next day or two days later or whatever. Then there's all of the uh, news reports, news uh, reporters reporting what people had seen, what people had told them, from competing newspapers, competing news sources, uh, biographies, letters written home, uh, all of these things from all of this very diverse set of sources, all saying roughly the same thing. Then there's the um, medical evidence, the autopsy, the medical reports uh, prior to death. So in order to doubt that Lincoln was shot in April of 1865, all of that stuff would have to be, in one way or another, faked or misunderstood uh, in one way or another. And this is, this is Burt's test from uh, Hannibal. All of that stuff has to be, in one way or another, presented as true even if it's false. So if you are denying the general statement, the reality that you're presenting, the reality that you are imposing or implying has to be so complicated that it fakes all this stuff 
and yet remains unseen and invisible and unevidenced. So if it's too complicated to imagine, then it has to be in one way or another kind of just set aside. This is where Occam's razor uh, comes in. So I go, Occam's razor, who is Occam? William of Occam was a 14th century Franciscan uh, friar. And the razor is a metaphorical razor that doesn't really show up in his writings at all. Uh, other philosophers later have pointed out, oh, use the, the term razor. And what it is, it's, it's a logical law called the uh, law of parsimony. I'm probably mispronouncing that. In Latin, it's, let's see if I can get this right, um, pluralitas non est ponenda sine necessite. Probably mispronounced it. And what it means is that plurality must not be imposed without necessity. So you don't explain a mystery with another mystery. Um, where do lightning bolts come from? Well, Zeus keeps them in a bucket by his throne and he throws them from Mount Olympus. Well, once you've said that, then you've generated a whole mess of other mysteries of, well, where does Zeus get the thunderbolts? What is this bucket made of? How does he aim them? How does he throw them from Mount Olympus? Why is he on top of Mount Olympus in the first place? Once you started com combining and constructing these new mysteries, it's just easier to believe the reality of whatever the science is. So if there are two competing statements, one that has a whole mess of mysteries that are designed, uh, sorry, that are explained with other mysteries, and one that isn't, the one that isn't is probably the one that's closer to being uh, the truth. Willard Van Orman Quine, in his book, uh, The Web of Belief, states that every factual statement is situated within a web of belief of other statements. It's interlocking, and so each statement functions not in a vacuum. It's connected to other things. So to deny that one statement is in a way to deny, by connection, lots of other stuff. So if you're presented with something, you have to answer the question, and you're looking to deny it. What else has to be false in order for your denial to be true? It has to be an extraordinary presentation, an extraordinary statement to deny gravity, to deny Lincoln's assassination, to deny whatever. As Carl Sagan said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. If it isn't presented, then it doesn't exist. So let's look at one of uh, Trump's more interesting, complicated uh, denials. Look at climate change. Perhaps by unweaving the argument, we can construct some kind of intellectual tool when faced with the brand new, uh, seemingly endless brand new statements from uh, his uh, Twitter feed. Now, in 2009, the National Geographic and Atmospheric Administration issued a state of the climate report that said, last se sentence of the introductory paragraph, global warming is undeniable. And usually, scientists are very cagey about saying something is undeniable. They're very, the evidence points to this, the evidence points away from that. It's, we have high probability that this is happening, whatever. But what they based it on is they took 10 what they call leading indicators, things like air temperature, humidity, uh, temperature over the oceans, surface temperature of the oceans, sea level, that sort of thing. And there were independent data sets all pointing in one direction. And I think there's 40 or 41 of these data sets. And it beautifully represents uh, the argument that Bertrand Russell was making, that if you find, in order to deny the basic statement, climate change is happening, you have to somehow deny all of that other stuff. The problem with um, climate change, with climate change deniers, is that they're faced with two separate kind of interlocking arguments, either the evidence is wrong, and then they have to explain how the evidence is wrong. No one ever gets around to that. Or the evidence is right, but the conclusion is wrong, in which case it requires, again, extraordinary evidence. It's never presented of why the conclusion is wrong. So it's not just a simple, well, this little piece of math found by someone in Canada is incorrect, therefore the whole thing is wrong, because it, uh, 
mathematical error on what was the warmest day or warmest year of the century, say, doesn't do anything to explain away the lack of glacial cover or the high CO, uh, CO2 content or the acidity of the oceans or any of that other stuff. All of that other stuff, the evidence still stands. So in order to challenge a statement, Russell's test is you have to ask yourself what will have to be true in order for all that stuff to be false. If that is presenting a reality that's far more complicated than the stuff that's true, or stuff that at least is presented as true, is probably the stuff that is uh, closer to being the truth rather than, you know, there's a pedophile ring run out of the basement of a pizza place in Washington, D.C. that doesn't happen to have a, a basement. So, wow, I'm really racing through my time. Um, so when, now that we have kind of a general question of how to face denials, how to face statements that are presented as factual that might not be factual, where do you go for evidence? Getting a little water. And how do you how do you rate whether something is a reliable source of information or not? Um, you have to ask yourself, well, what is a couple of different things. There's a model in my head. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with writing or, or blogging or anything. But if, say, you're doing some investing and you invest, there are things with high risk and things with low risk. If you invest in, say, T-bills, they're fully backed by the trust in whatever of the American government, very low risk, very low return. And the problem is that if they fail, the risk is so low that they fail, your problems, problems you're going to face are humongously bigger than just you've lost $1,000 on a T-bill. So the question that you have to ask yourself in looking at a source is what is the risk that any of this is actually not true? And whether... And it it's kind of is a corollary, corollary to how much the politics of the writer, politics of the source, may in fact spin the conclusion. So if, if the politics are reduced to next to nothing, then it's probably pretty safe to assume that what you're reading corresponds to reality. So there are governmental sources that are apolitical. Um, Bureau uh, labor statistics or crime statistics, where the bureaucracy of that department, it's their job to just churn out these numbers uh, every year, every month, every decade, whatever, where the administration may change back and forth, but that bureaucracy stays the same. The, the methodology stays the same. There's a, a functionality of keeping everything as clean as possible in order to be able to uh, rely on the uh, on the conclusions. There are political uh, sources within government. The Senate and the House have various committees. The Committee of the Judiciary, Committee of Science and Technology, whatever. Um, and the way they're structured these days is that the party that's in power will have more members on a given committee. Um, and I'm not sure how it's already, uh, how it's defined as far as a if it's a big committee, there'll be more um, majority members. Although I think there are a couple, um, couple committees in each house that it's halfway. Uh, I think some ethics committees and maybe some national security uh, committees. But let's set those aside uh, for a second. And the problem with it is that if there's a report written, there'll be a majority report and a minority report. And depending on your politics, you'll like the majority report or in dislike the minority part because it's telling you what you want to hear. And that's always the danger in how you approach whether something is true or not. Richard Feynman, who if you've watched uh, Big Bang Theory, you know who Richard Feynman is. His very famous quote that says, the first principle is that you must not fool yourself. And you are the easiest person to fool. Now, I don't mean me saying that to you. It's whoever is saying it has to say that to themselves. The easy self-deception is the easiest thing in the world, especially if you are trying to figure out 
in politics, what is true, because human beings are naturally inclined to just read or learn the stuff that they already agree with. May be true, may not be true. There's even some very frustrating uh, social science that says that as you, I'm trying to put this together, um, as you challenge someone on something that they believe to be true, a small core of that audience will actually, even if you've presented them with A plus B equals C, and everything is true and accurate and logical, their belief in what is not true will harden. There are still people who believe, for instance, that uh, the world is flat. Um, I think uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson got into a Twitter war, war, a Twitter argument uh, about a year ago with, with someone who was convinced that the world was flat and you could not convince him otherwise, that any argument that he constructed, the flat earth guy had a counter for, and then Neil deGrasse Tyson would have a counter for that. And so suddenly you're going, well, is the world flat or not? So there, there is a frustrating uh, part of the human mind that even when presented with a debunking, people will tend to remember the lie remember the thing that's debunked and not that it was debunked, uh, which is always a, I guess, a risk for the, me doing what I'm doing is as I'm spreading, as I'm debunking things, there's always a danger that whoever reads it will remember what I've debunked as true and forget that I've uh, debunked it. There are also legislative sources, very interesting legislative sources for checking up on things. Uh, Thomas.gov is a, is a good place to start. There will be, within legislation, uh, you can actually read the legislation, you can find a congressional summary, which is very neutral. Uh, there's also a uh, voting record, uh, if there's a roll call in the House, a roll call in the, in the Senate. And for instance, a uh, number, since I have some time, I can go into a story, a number of, I think within the last year, year and a half or so, uh, there were three amendments in the, in the Senate. I don't know if they were exactly amendments or statements of feelings of the Senate or thoughts of the Senate, something like that, on climate change. And our, our junior senator uh, voted on them. And the first one he voted, uh, he voted on stated, climate change is not a hoax, basically, I'm paraphrasing. The second, chain, the second one was climate change is not a hoax and human beings have contributed to it. Uh, he voted for those two. He voted in the affirmative for those two. And that would, that's what made it into the news. It was the third one that he voted against that you can find in Thomas.gov that it was climate change is not a hoax. Human beings have contributed to it and human beings have contributed to it significantly. It was the significantly word, it the, the two resolutions were exactly the same except for the word significantly. He voted against that. So what made it into the news was the second resolution and not the third one. So the question is, does he deny the science or not? Well, if you look at the third one, yes, he does. If you look at the second one and ignore the third one, then no, he doesn't. Um, I blogged on it and it was, he's a science denier for denying the significant part. When you get into the news media, it's roughly the same issue of how much risk are you taking to believe that something is true. There is the middle of the road mainstream media, which gets uh, trashed as lamestream media, depending on where you are, both on the right and the left. Um, and I think we all know Noam Chomsky's criticism of media culture that in order to make it up the ladder, so to speak, into a editorial uh, process, editorial position, you already have to have a pro-business bias in your personality. And so even though the reporters tend to be, say, centri uh, centrist and left, the editors tend to be centrist and right. Uh, I guess the only solution to that is to have a large number of competing news sources on a given topic, and then where they clash, um, where they clash, and that's where you can start to investigate whether something is, whether what they're saying is actually true, because one's bias will be 
countered by uh, another. As you start moving out of the mainstream, say into the right and into the left, the risk of something being not true or being spun um, increases, although they're certainly still reliable. You can look at, say, the National Review, uh, which I would agree with maybe 4% of the time, beautifully written uh, magazine, beautifully written stuff, just disagree with it. On the left, say you've got Mother Jones or The Nation or, or whatever, uh, somewhere close to the left, there might be The New Republic, if it's still being published, I'm not sure. But the question is, how much of a risk are you taking in believing something is true in a politically oriented magazine to begin with? Might be true, might not be true. As you get farther away, out into the fringes, say uh, Alex Jones or World Net Daily, the risk is very high that what they're saying is just absolutely wrong. Same thing with uh, on the left. Um, I can't believe I looked it up and Lyndon LaRouche is still alive. And the LaRouche people are still very active. And for them, the Beatles were constructed by British intelligence in order to undermine uh, American culture. Still folks who, who believe that. Uh, and it's wacky and it's on the left and it's far enough out that the risk of it being just total BS, really, really, really very high. Now the question is, if you find something in there, do you source it? Prob I would say probably not, only because the, if you consider the source, the source being something wacky on the right or on the left, it's very easy to go, well, you're, it, by sourcing it, you are validating the source, you're authorizing the source itself, in which case you've run into a whole whole mess of other trouble because then what else are you going to authorize from that, uh, from that source? Although if, it's, if there is a report, World Net Daily says, uh, Congressional Budget Office says blah, 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 then you find the report, in which case you've kind of, you know, was it shoots and ladders back up to the top to a more or less verifiable uh, government report. There are a number of fact-checking organizations uh, factcheck.org, Edinburgh Pol uh, Public Policy Center, PolitiFact out of the Tampa Bay Times, Snopes is an independent one. Uh, newspapers will have maybe their own independent um, fact checker, a guy named Glenn Kessler at the Washington Post. The AP has a fact checker as well, or probably a staff of fact checkers. And those are reliable in the sense that they show you their work. You can see what they're, what they're sourcing. But the, the solution really, as I, as I said in the, in the top, is how do we as citizens navigate through it all? Well, you read through factcheck.org on whatever topic, see what they do, and then when something else is presented to you, try to do the same thing. If there is, if your local congressman says, well, according to this report from blah, 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 it says X, Y, Z. Well, go find the report. Does your congressperson, does your representative, are they taking it out of context? Are they reliably relating the information to you? If you find in the report something that contradicts what he just said, then he's lying or she's lying. So the trick is to, in a sense, kind of do it yourself. Do your own fact checking modeled after um, the fact checkers at factcheck.org or PolitiFact or whatever. Keeping in mind that the sources that you use each carry their own set of risk as to how much they are reliable. If you've loaded up your factual material with stuff that's more or less reliable, then you're probably closer to the truth. Although in, you know, on planet Earth, good healthy skepticism is, uh, is a very important thing. Um, rule of thumb is you basically have to ask yourself, what, who are the source that I'm sourcing, that I'm relating, that I'm referencing. Is there a kind of a vested interest in that writer trying to prove that they are right and my position is wrong? I mean, in a sense, everything does that. But the government reports or the non-governmental reports or the Pentagon defense estimate, uh, you know, quadrennial defense estimates, uh, they're just doing their best to present you or present the reader with whatever the facts that they are that they can see. If you're reading in, say, the Heritage Foundation, some Heritage Foundation report that low taxes will trigger um, 
uh, business growth and trigger the economy? Well, that's pretty obvious from the Heritage Foundation. If you see something like that from a left-leaning uh, organization, uh, Brookings Institution, say, or I don't know, if you read it out of Mother Jones, then it probably has a little more weight to it if it runs counter to their own political spin. Um, so if you're reading something from a conservative source, then you have to expect a conservative answer. If it doesn't turn out to be a conservative answer, then that's something to pay attention to. But you have to check whether the sources are used correctly, whether they're taken out of context, whether uh, anything that you say, you go, okay, well, what if it's not true? What would have to be true in order for whatever it is to be not true? And if that presents something, if that presents a reality that's even bigger, even more complicated, like um, uh, I remember reading or hearing a, there was a, there was a critic of the Starr investigation, Kenneth Starr, that because because he let Clinton off the hook, he must have been in on the conspiracy. Uh, when you think about Kenneth Starr, you go, well, that's absolutely ridiculous. So therefore, the person saying it, probably not close to being, being the truth. But if you situate yourself as close as you can to anything that is more or less factual, factual, reliable, assuming, of course, that anything can be you know, I mean, we live in a quantum universe where uh, sometimes things go kind of, kind of weird. Um, probably you'll be closer to being the truth. And something to remember, and I'll close with this, uh, George Orwell said that the freedom is the freedom to say that one plus one equals four. If that's granted, then all else follows. And that's the end of my, pre oops, the end of my presentation. Do we have any... Um, questions. Okay. Class dismissed. Test on Thursday. <laughs>